the Big Apple today is a frozen tundra. We just reached 10 degrees, two digits, double digits. So we're on the uh, upswing of things. Though in reality, when it's like 15 or 18 degrees and it's south of there, does it really matter? I mean, cold is cold. The silver lining for today's polar vortex is that there's no wind. But the city has like an eerie calmness to it. (laughs) It's quiet. People do not want to go outside. If they came to work, they're hunkering down. Work is a safe place today. Welcome to Insight. My name is Mark Farrell on the Progressive Radio Network. Lisa Shulman, Shulman rather, Dr. Shulman, is going to be joining me later to discuss her new book, Before and After Loss, a neurologist's perspective on loss, grief, and our brain. Really fascinating new work that explores the effects of losing and grieving a loved one on the mind, brain, and body. Fascinating stuff. I was really kind of riveted by the research and the material and how she came about it. It's interesting because, you know, as a doctor, you know, you experience things, I can't say differently, but I, I guess that's kind of an accurate word because sometimes they're too close to a, a subject to realize what they're experiencing themselves because they diagnose everyone else, but to diagnose himself is a bit tricky sometimes and or avoided. So it's interesting that when she lost her husband, she really delved into her feelings, why she felt a certain way for a while, and did a lot of research on it. So I really commend her, commend Dr. Shulman on this. We'll get to her in a bit. So my son is getting tutored in math. And it's pretty funny. The tutor said to me yesterday, you know, I just spoke to one of my colleagues and I told her I was coming over to your house to tutor your son. And they're like, why? He's so good in math. And I said, well, that, that's nice to know that they think that. But And she agrees as well. But you want to stay on top of things. You want to get ahead of the curve. And that's, I think, not emblematic on a national level. You know, parents are just so stretched for time. You know, if you get to actually review your child's homework at night, it's a good night uh, because, you know, working multiple jobs or just the hours that are involved or just so tired and bushed and feeling that maybe your child is competent enough that you don't have to check their work. Uh, But the reality is you do. You have to. And we all are guilty of this sometimes by saying, did you do your homework? Great. How's it look? Great. Okay, good. Excellent. Let me sign off on it. But it's so imperative to be involved in every aspect of their school due to, you know, it it doesn't take long at all to slip. And just also for the mere fact to show your child, to prove to your child how much of a part of um, the academic and educational process you want to be involved in. Because it's not always just hounding them to do the work. It can be kind of a a team and collaborative effort in making sure that it's fun, it gets done uh, not only to standard, but even kind of excel in that area. And I think, and this could be a little bit of an embellishment, but I find that a lot of people are happy with their child just doing the status quo. And I think that can be the beginning of a life of middle packers. You know the expression middle packers where, you know, do you want to be in the middle pack or do you want to rise to the top? Do you want to be more of a leader or someone who's a real expediter, a producer, someone who really just doesn't settle for the status quo? So I think it's imperative that, you know, that we start at a very, very young age. Now, I was tutored a lot uh, when I was a kid and I really, I guess it helped, but um Looking at some of my son's work now, I'm like, oh, man, I don't remember this. It's kind of crazy. But anyway, you know, due to my visual impairment, I was always behind in school with not being able to see the board, especially math. Even if I was able to see the board sitting incredibly close close to the board and embarrassed that it was so involved, the little nuances uh, it with math and algebra, uh, forget calculus, never made it. Uh, but it was just very, very difficult. And I remember riding my bike 
once or twice a week across town to get tutored by a, a great, as a matter of fact, he's probably much more influential on my my disabled advocacy work in the community because this this gentleman, uh, he's actually my age, he was a peer, but he's brilliant. Brian was really and is very, very brilliant. Um, he's in a wheelchair, still is, doing incredibly well. And he was so sweet and kind to um, dedicate time. You know, of course, he was compensated, but just to to help somebody who obviously was not really getting it. <laughs> and um, he was very, very patient and very uh, well-mannered. And just the way he explained things and his patience, I just really was very, very happy about that. So I had a, a tutor for uh, many, many years. Um, I remember actually, this is pretty funny, riding my bike to go to CCD. And because I was in a public school at that time. And I remember that my mother worked two jobs, being a single um, mother raising five kids. And it was up to me to get to CCD. So I, most of the time, did not make it there because was I going to leave my friends, you know, in a group of guys riding bikes to go to CCD? I think not. So I would just blow it off. So I remember, distinctly remember, being in class, like one of the last classes before confirmation, and the teacher saying, you know, Mark hasn't done whatever X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. Let's take a vote to see if Mark should get confirmed. And everyone raised their hand. And that's how I got confirmed. Isn't that crazy? It's pretty funny looking back at it. I, I can't remember the teacher at all. Usually there's someone who's affiliated with the church. But I wonder if they, too, remember that story. But anyway, going back to tutoring, I think it's vital. Um, if your kid's doing well, great. Do you want them to stay ahead of the curve? Absolutely. Be involved. Get ensconced with everything that they're doing. Obviously, you don't you know smother them, but just to have an idea. So when you go to the school, you know exactly what's going on. And the fact is, being able to me- email teachers um, nowadays is just so beneficial. And the immediacy of it, I love it because I'd say eight times out of ten, I email a teacher and bam, myself and my wife get a response, I'd say within a couple hours. And that's great because it, it sometimes is not the most pressing question. But to be able to have that connectivity conduit to the teacher is something that we never had, you know, growing up. So I think that's great. I mean, you would have to go make a phone call and then maybe the phone call, you didn't want to bother them because it maybe seemed like a trivial question, but it really works out well. And it's a great communication tool, and especially since a lot of schools how now have apps. And so they're giving notifications, you know, uh, one, two, three, four or five days a week, which is kind of cool. It keeps everybody up to speed. Drew Drew Brees is the uh, quarterback for the Saints. Unfortunately, they are not in the Super Bowl. (laughs) Real bummer. I would love to see them in the Super Bowl versus, um, you know, New England Patriots once again. But anyway, the point I want to mention to you is that he contributed to the establishment of a park for children with disabilities in New Orleans. And I think that's fantastic. It's the only one in existence. Uh, Chairs can fit on swings. Wheelchairs can fit on swings. There are are Braille identifiers and so much more. So he footed half the bill for this, and there's another organization that footed the other half. But Drew Brees privately did that, and I tip my hat to Drew because I think that's just something that's really, really incredible. In just a few minutes, we're going to meet Dr. Shulman. Her new book is Before and After Loss, a neurologist's perspective on loss, grief, and our brain. Very, very interesting because it's interwoven with her personal story and research, uh, neurology, grief, and she uh, shares about the loss of her um, uh, and the impact on traumatic brain injury. And there's so many different components to that, and I look forward to meeting Dr. Shulman in just a few minutes. Um, Speaking of Super Bowl, are you psyched for it? Now, I'm not really. As a matter of fact, for the first time, I think ever, not that I've been married to my wife ever, only in uh, nine years, but I said to her, hey, do you want to go to the movies? And she said, when? I said, Sunday. Uh, Before the game? I said, no, during the game. She goes, are you kidding me? You are so lackluster about the Super Bowl, you're willing to forego it and go to the movies? I said, yeah. She goes, wow, wow, that sounds pretty cool. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I just hope for a good game, but, you know, I, I don't care if I see it. Maroon 5 performing at halftime. 
don't really care too much about them. As a matter of fact, I don't think people are very, very happy. Most people um, who are staunch, do the right thing, <laughs> kind of um, blacklisting the NFL a little bit uh, that Maroon 5 is performing. As a matter of fact, Maroon 5, I think, is kind of feeling the heat a little bit because they declined to do a press conference this week in Atlanta where the actual um, Super Bowl is taking place, all the pre-show uh, press conferences. As a matter of fact, Roger Goodell gave one yesterday, and he was grilled about the whole bad refing in the uh, last Sunday of the playoffs. And I know he said something to the fact where, you know, where everything is on a the table, they're investigating everything, including status quo. So I don't know why someone who's the um, head of the NFL would say, including status quo, obviously that's kind of a given, but it almost makes it sound like, well, we're already considering doing nothing. And that's kind of a bad thing to say, especially with on the eve of such a giant game that's just representative of the two best, the best of everything, broadcasters, players, referees, you name it. So uh, I was kind of disappointed, but no no real surprise from Roger Goodell. Um, also, I want to talk about, um, after our interview uh, with the doctor, about my work history. That, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that much of it um, until recently. From time to time, people say to me, oh, I have experience in that. I'm like, yeah, 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 I did that too. They're like, really? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, you know, I've done a few things. And, and there's a guy who uh, I've become friends with. He lives down the street from me. He's a farmer. And farmers are one of the hardest working people in the world. Actually, I think they are the hardest working people in the world because depending on where they live in the world, um, they're always preparing, uh, cropping, seeding, plowing, you name it, tilling for the next season, and they don't have any downtime. Anyway, so this guy is not only a great farmer, he's just gifted all around. So we were talking about different things, and I'm like, wow, really uh, fascinating that you also are really adept in X, Y, and Z. And then we started talking, and he was just kind of uh, impressed with my background. And it made me think about, you know, how we develop a work mantra, at such a young age, how influential our parents are in establishing those roles that will last a lifetime. I mean, how many of us can say, yeah, my father or mother was a slacker? I don't know. I'm 52. And, you know, my parents worked like dogs. I mean, they provided well for us. I mean, we were middle class. Um, but, you know, my parents were divorced when I was very young. My father was still in the picture. But uh, my mother worked two jobs. She was a high school nurse, and then she worked at a uh, diet clinic uh, three hours after that every day. So she was a hustler. I mean, you kind of have your kind of have to be a uh, have your side hustle on nowadays to, to make it in the economy in the world. So anyway, after this um, a great conversation with Dr. Shulman coming up momentarily, we're going to talk about that because I think it's imperative for us as parents to think of that. Even if uh, it's just conversation about other people in front of our kids, because they should understand that, you know, work ethic, it gets established right now in their school, because how you perceive and how you undertake one's school work translates into the actual work in the real world after high school, after college, after your uh, higher degree, et cetera. The show is Insight on the Progressive Radio Network. Thanks for tuning in this Thursday and every Thursday. My name is Mark Farrell. Always love your input. 888-874-4888. 888-874-4888. Dr. Shulman is joining me from somewhere hopefully much, much warmer than right here in New York. We're actually happy to make it to double digits, 10 degrees. She's the author of a new book, Before and After Loss, A Neurologist's Perspective on Loss, Grief and Brain. And it explores the effects of losing and grieving a loved one on the mind, brain, and body. Dr. Shulman, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Where are you located? In chilly Baltimore. Oh, <laughs> so you're not experiencing much better weather than us. Nope. Nope. Doctor, I got one word to say to you. Bourbon. Yeah. Bourbon. Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Can you write me a script for that? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to tip my hat to you because, unfortunately, you lost your husband at a way too young age. Yeah. And um, it really rocked your world, understandably. 
But instead of just, you know, going through your process of grieving, understandably, as a scientific person, a person of the medical arts, that wasn't good enough because you want to delve in deeper and understand the psychological aspects, the the physical aspects of grieving. And it just went to a whole nother level. And I find it fascinating about what you have uncovered of what we kind of thought we already knew, but didn't. Yeah, well, you know, you really put your finger on it, um, but uh, it's really even more um, in, uh, in significant than you're saying because, you know, I was really, uh, like you say, uh, like many people who experience loss in their life of all types, you know, your life is just turned upside down. And uh, I think that maybe we are um, misled to think that with time, you know, things will just heal and, and, and uh, we'll find some quote-unquote closure. But uh, that isn't the experience of, of many people. Instead, it's a very, very tough road. And in fact, my uh, drilling down into the science of this to understand how loss affected the brain was uh, part of my own uh path of healing. So it was really, I started this not to write a book. I started it to figure out what in the world was going on because I was experiencing the same thing so many people talk about in terms of disorientation and loss of bearings. Were those some of the symptoms that really kind of threw you off your path in life, those two that you just mentioned? Yeah, I mean, it was just so much more encompassing than um, uh, I ever anticipated. And of course, you know, as a uh, neurologist treating people with serious diseases, Mm. uh, I somehow had um, deluded myself to think I understood what they were going through. Uh, But instead, what I found was that uh, there was this incredible feeling of um, detachment from the world, uh, having uh, lost my way, uh, really even a feeling of not uh, understanding uh, my own position uh, vis-a-vis my life and going forward. Was this the first point in your life where you had to grieve over the loss of someone close to you? Well, uh, yes. And and I think that, you know, uh, we never, I, I'm careful in terms of whenever uh, discussing uh, loss and grief with others to never have any preconceptions about people's mm-hmm. losses and what it means to them because uh, you we can never understand uh the experience of others' grief and loss, uh, and it's a very isolating experience. Tell me about the, um, I guess, I can never say layman when speaking with you, doctor, but uh, conceptually speaking about what you thought grief and loss had on the mind prior to the loss of your husband and doing this investigation versus what you've learned post. That's that's a good question. Uh, you know, I I... I think that I conceptualized grief in a very simplistic way of thinking of it as um, profound depression and sorrow and uh, hadn't really thought about it much beyond that, to be perfectly honest. And it wasn't until uh, my own experience that I found uh, and learned that depression and grief are quite different in terms of their definition. Uh, They're different in terms of their treatments. And uh, grief uh, very often involves uh, trauma and chronic stress that has profound effects on the mind and the brain and the body. And talk about those effects, please, Doctor. What exactly happens, transpires, or does not, doesn't happen, rather? Well, you know, when we have um, serious uh, emotional trauma or um, chronic stress, but, you know, also acute stressors when people we love are uh, declining and, uh, you know, having such difficulties. Uh, This causes something that many people now know of as neuroplasticity, uh, which is a fancy word, but simply means that the neural connections in our brain uh, change and are remodeled in response to our experiences. So when we are experiencing um, traumatic events in our lives, there are these uh, changes to the neural circuitry uh, that, in fact, starts to occur within minutes and hours. But then, as uh, you know, in many experiences, you're dealing with a problem over uh, long periods of time. These uh, unhealthy um, connections 
become more and more fixed. And these connections tend to make us feel, in general, more uh, anxious, uh, more fearful. It's kind of like the fear center of the brain Hmm. is on overdrive and can't be uh, calmed down. That's fascinating. Doctor, is there any way that we have control over these uh, pathways of them not latching on too long? And and if so, how can we control them? Well, you know, uh, that's probably the most uh, significant part of uh, what I learned because uh, in the same way that neuroplasticity occurs in response to um, traumatic experience and stress, neuroplasticity can be reversed by uh, meaningful and thoughtful approaches. And uh, what we need to do is, uh, in order to reverse these uh, changes, is to thoughtfully and deliberately go down a difficult path of reconnecting and re-exposing ourselves to these difficult memories in order to, um, you know, sort of like integrate these difficult experiences into our life story. Uh, It's also important, of course, to have, you know, uh, enjoyable, rejuvenating times with Mm. friends and family and other hobbies, but we can't do just that. We can't just distract ourselves. We do have to uh, expose ourselves to that difficult stuff. When you found out this critical information, were you able to, to apply that to yourself, or has this was this further down the road for you, and you were mostly well, I can't say healthy or recovered, but you know what I'm alluding to. Right. So, uh, you know, in, in the book, I, I do talk about um, not only the science, but also my own experience and what worked best for me, which may not be what works best for everybody. But you know, I started to use journaling. And not only daytime journaling of the thoughts that were rolling around in my mind and causing anxiety, but also um, journaling dreams and working on dream interpretation. Mm. And those were tools that were very effective for me. Other people may use things like um, art therapy. Um, People may be very creative and have other sorts of creative practices that help them reconnect with uh, the inner work of grief. Uh, And some people use more conventional approaches like seeing a counselor. Which is great. I mean, it's also another form of discussing it and keeping those memories alive, good, bad, or indifferent, and it can help in that process. It's interesting when you uh, mentioned um, about dreams because uh, I think you put a lot of stock in dreams in terms of like uh, introducing thoughts, obviously your mind's activity. It's kind of like a, it's leading you down a road. And a lot of people, I can't say a lot of people, I know some people that I speak to don't put a lot of stock into dreams, but I'm, I'm fascinated by dreams. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, my uh, discussion of dreams is, is particularly uh, interesting and unique in the book because, you know, the truth is that uh, I can say as a, a physician, Uh, Traditionally, there isn't a lot of focus on dreams. But the interesting thing is that, you know, what appears in our dreams is exactly what we need to um, be exposed to and learn more about when we're going through these difficult times because, you know, we don't dream about the things that are just the common experience that aren't um, difficult for us. The things that appear in our dreams are very symbolic and are precisely what is sitting in our subconscious and causing us difficulty. Yeah, I think there's um, a great deal of interest, and I think people are shortchanging themselves when they don't. And I understand, certainly I'm guilty of this, when you don't remember them right away or you wake up in the morning immediately or in the middle of the night and you're like, wow, you're stunned. And and one of the things that I have recurring dreams on is my father, lost my father uh, 20 years ago, died of Alzheimer's. Mm. And we have this great connection in a dream, which is just a a simplistic way of just keeping that connection. Well, you know, you're right that uh, many people um, are somewhat frustrated and say, well, you know, I don't think I dream or I never remember them. And, you know, some of the tips um, are that, as you said, you need to keep uh, paper and pencil near your bedside. And as soon as you have those first thoughts when uh, you're awakening, 
you need to jot down those first thoughts because then you can go back to them and fill in the blanks. And very often those first thoughts seem completely, uh, you know, ridiculous (laughs) and silly and meaningless. And it isn't until you have some time to fill in the blanks and uh, look at it time and time again that it starts to show its meaning. Dr. Shulman, how much of the human brain do we really know of? I remember years ago reading, it was something about 50 or 80% of the brain that we do know, but the vast majority of it that we still had no idea of exactly all of its motor functions. Is that still accurate? Well, you know, you're you're quite right in saying that um, the brain, you know, is usually considered the the biggest challenge and the final frontier um, because of its complexity uh, and you know we're we're making vast uh, advances because of all of the technologic advances whether you're talking about imaging uh, genetics uh, looking at even neural circuits these days um, biochemistry we have so much more insight but when you actually look at the numbers of of nerve cells in the brain, the number of connections, mm. the fact that the connections are constantly being remodeled, as I just said, we do have a lot of work to do. Was there any research in your book? I know you did a vast research. Did any of it include any imaging of someone's brain who uh, possibly is grieving in one way versus another? Yes. Uh, I cited a number of uh, studies uh, looking at that. And, and uh, besides the kinds of common um, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging that people hear about mm. that looks at the structure of the brain with great uh, precision, uh, those kinds of studies are, that are most interesting are called functional MRI, where you're looking at brain activity, areas of the brain that are active, for example, when people are grieving. And, you know, there are a number of uh, interesting things. One is that um, the same regions of the brain are shown to be activated when people are experiencing either physical pain or uh, emotional pain. Uh, and that shows the, uh, the incredible similarities between uh, emotional pain and actual what we usually think of as, as physical um, traumatic brain injury. So that's a very important thing. Uh, and there are also some very important studies cited concerning people who look at um, photos of the people they've lost versus um, photos of strangers and uh, demonstrate how brain areas are much more strongly activated by these personal mementos than by others. You mentioned something that's all very fascinating. <laughs> I want to touch on one point you mentioned in terms of certain parts of the brain that are reactionary to going through the grieving process. Are those parts of the brain usually dedicated to other aspects of functionality that can't actually maybe do their job as ordinary if someone's grieving? Yeah, you're, you're really touching on a very important point there because, um, you know, I started out by talking about how people who are grieving, including myself, uh, experience a feeling of disorientation. They often talk about a fog of confusion. People frequently talk about forgetting, not being able to recall uh, events hmm. around the time of loss. Uh, and and as a matter of fact, people who are grieving are more likely to be accident prone. All of those things uh, can be explained by what you were saying, that a big part, important parts of our uh, brain, important brain regions are so busy working, working overtime on protecting us and handling the stress that, of course, it's not so surprising that we experience that fog of confusion. Dr. Shulman is my guest. She has written a compelling new book, Before and After Loss, A Neurologist's Perspective on Loss, Grief, and Our Brain. Thank you for joining us today. Call number is 888-874-4888. My name is Mark Farrell. The show is Insight. Doctor, you mentioned something very interesting. Um, if, if you would have thought about um, your grieving period um, before, obviously, husband or anyone, um, what you would have thought grief meant and what it was the biggest thing that you were so knocked over by in terms of the whole process, if it's one or two aspects that you would have had. Obviously, 
with all your research, it uncovered a lot. But in terms of one or two aspects that really just really threw you for loop in terms of you would have no idea the brain would um, accommodate and or react that way. I mean, I, I guess that, you know, the, the most, um, the most, uh, significant thing I think of when you talk about that is that the whole process was just so much more, uh, difficult than I expected. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, many of us are used to a very busy life and we cope with all sorts of adversity in our life. Sure. Um, but, uh, this, uh, the reason why I wrote the book is because I, I thought that this was truly uh, in a time of peril uh, because, you know, one's own identity can be uh, threatened by a very significant loss. Uh, so uh, that, was, that is the reason for the book, that for people going through um, serious grief, serious loss of various types, uh, I think it was important to talk about how, why you feel the way you're feeling, because that can potentially demystify the experience and help all of us who go through this not feel like we're the only one, that we're failing, and sometimes even feel like we're going crazy. Mm -hmm. But no, there's good explanation for this. Absolutely. The only way I can kind of uh, relate, I mean, I've had loss in my life, I've grieved, um, on deaths that were, you know, a natural cycle and then deaths that were certainly senseless, like my brother who died by suicide. And then I went through my own panic attacks, anxiety, and depression. So I'm pretty familiar, very familiar with my body. As a matter of fact, when I speak to schools and colleges, I say to people, I'm not an MD, but you have to be an expert in yourself because you have to know the way you tick and the way you think and what makes you think and how to respond to that. So it's very, very important to have an internal dialogue. And I know, obviously, you counsel people for a living uh, over life-threatening crises. And I, I read that you had a flash of insight and saw your own experience through the eyes of a neurologist. Expand upon that, please. Well, yeah, that was a very pivotal moment. And, uh, you know, I mean, basically, I went through... Uh, a significant period of time where, as I've explained, the whole experience was um, bewildering. Uh, I felt very disoriented. I didn't understand what was going on. And then at one pivotal moment in time, I encountered um, a strong uh, emotional memory. This was, uh, without warning, seeing a scribbled note from um, my husband and being kind of really startled by it. Mm. And, um, you know, essentially, for the first time ever, I noticed that I actually lost the period of time after being um, triggered by this strong emotion. Uh, and when I realized that there had been this period of um, unawareness for a brief period of time, which is known as dissociation, for the first time as a neurologist, I realized that the experience I kept on thinking of as being profound sorrow was really a a change of brain function, Uh, what neurologists call um, by the the name altered mental status. And I realized I was experiencing an alteration of consciousness at times in response to triggers. And that led me to really say, I've got to understand this stuff. Wow, that's fascinating. I really applaud you for delving head first into this because there, there's so much to it. And I, I really think this is going to be something that's going to be very, very beneficial to society overall. And, and that's a great uh, contribution to make. I mean, the fact that obviously you turn a loss into a big gain and that's, that's incredible. Can you talk about, you wrote about TBI and CD, CTE, which are, are huge components in the news and very relevant nowadays, obviously uh, usually on the gridiron, but talk about its application here, please. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think that the, there's an interesting evolution because um, when I was first taught about uh, traumatic brain injury, TBI, you know, I was taught about um, very serious uh, trauma to the brain. And now in more recent years, we have uh, widened, broadened the definition of TBI to include more mild forms of traumatic brain injury, such as concussion, 
where, you know, in fact, after a concussion, you know, for example, a sports injury, people may very well um, recover uh, after a short period of time. And in fact, if you did an MRI or you examined the person neurologically, you wouldn't see any evidence of damage. However, we know that in fact there was an injury and that although we can't uh, see it on the MRI, that doesn't mean it didn't happen uh, because it's at too small a level uh, to show up on the structural imaging. And I think that there's an analogy there um, uh, for this type of emotional trauma that I'm talking about. Again, uh, there's injury that is hidden uh, and has long-term uh, sequelae. And, you know, it's very similar no matter what kind of emotional trauma you experience. For example, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm, sure. So there are very strong overlaps between the symptoms that are known as post-concussive syndrome, the long-term effects after concussion, uh, and the very symptoms we've been talking about regarding grief, and regarding PTSD. I find the brain, fast, the human body in general is fascinating, and if I were to do it all over again, I would have an, M- I would have an MD after my name <laughs> because I'm so fascinated by it. Now, with all this new evidence, would this be safe to say that this is one of the most fascinating aspects of the brain? Obviously, it's new. It's still recent. It's something that still probably marvels you. But what about the brain, and it could be this as well, that just really you find just remarkable? Well, you know, I think that what we're talking about here is um, symbolic of the um, incredible uh, change where we know more and more about the brain's uh, function and mechanism of all types of uh, behavior, emotions, and various psychological and psychiatric phenomena. So what is occurring now the, uh, over time is that psychiatry and neurology are growing, growing ever, ever closer. Mm. And this is an opportunity. It's a, um, a, an opportunity and opening to explain uh, all of our experiences uh, by brain mechanisms. That's pretty exciting. It is. It is. And it must be, we're going to get a little sidetracked here, but I think it's part and parcel to our conversation because society has changed. You can say it's evolved, say it's devolved, uh, depends on your perspective. But in terms of how we are living, as a neurologist, you must be seeing different cases where uh, technology plays such a vital role in terms of um, digital connectivity for people, the way we're eating affects the brain, how we live, how we act, how we talk. So all these vital components must be interesting for you to see how lives are changing and, and what you're seeing in your office. It is uh, it is a very uh, exciting time uh, to be a clinician and a neurologist because our patients are ever more informed and ever more uh, <laughs> interested and proactive about being involved in their own care, which you, you talked about before, you know, and I, and, and it's a, it can be a challenge, but it's also a wonderful uh, sure. step in the right direction. Mm. Any advice for uh, whether it's grieving in terms of having a healthy brain? Um, obviously, we know exercise is very vital. Uh, all the research, you know, you can pick up the newspaper any given day and read about how blood flow is so beneficial. Uh, oxygenated blood, et cetera. But in terms of diet, was that any uh, part of your study? Um, you know, uh, diet itself uh, was not. I um, did. I do talk about uh, in the book uh, some of the uh, impacts of um, food, and um, I mean, food is very important as as um, kind of a source of memory, hmm. meal times, and eating with people, and those kinds of things. So that's very important. But what we're what we're finding. Uh, overall, as you said quite rightly, is that exercise, physical activity is among the most important things we can do for uh, a healthy mind and brain. And diet, although of course it's important to have the basic nutrients, uh, thus far the evidence uh, isn't as strong. So I think that really what we have to think about is not only physical activity, 
but also cognitive activity and even social activity. Social engagement is important. Do you find that society here in the United States is uh, still in an awkward in an awkward position and role in terms of dealing with death, and that uh, can lead to obviously problems in grieving. Oh, definitely, and that's also one of the goals uh, in my mind in terms of writing a book like mm. this, which is to normalize the experience of grief, because there is still some aspect of stigma, and sure. that adds to the. Um, burden for people going through this because uh, they don't really know how to talk about it in public. And the public, people don't know what to say very often. So you're quite right that um, there is still a problem with uh, accepting this as being, let's face it, uh, a normal part of life. How has this incredible research been, uh, I'm sure you're very well acquainted with all the medical journals journals and reviews. Um, what was your feedback when this material appeared in there? Because I would imagine this would just be uh, something that's so riveting and embraced in the community, medical community. Well, the, the book was published just in mid-December, so um, I'm interested in that question right now myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the <laughs> metrics. Let's see those metrics. I'm, I'm very interested because I'm getting, you know, a very strong response uh, from... Um, the community and from the public, and uh, I'll be very interested because I plan to speak at um, medical conferencing, you know, to see what the response is there, too. That's fascinating. The component where you've actually created something tangible out of something that's, you know, extreme situation, uh, a sad situation, but as a clinician, you know, you know the reality of life. It's a cycle. Um, unfortunately, your husband's cycle was shorter um, than it should have been. But the reality is you turn something that's very, very negative into something that's incredibly positive for yourself and for you know, millions of people to experience and, and possibly turn, um, open a door in the medical community that each and every one of us can benefit from. So I, I hope you take a, a great pride in that. Well, I, I really appreciate your support. And uh, it's really, your questions have been great, and I've appreciated being on your show. Oh, thank you, my friend. Um, now, this is printed by, I'm sorry, I don't have that note in front of me. That's, um, the publisher is Johns Hopkins That's University John Press. Hopkins. And so people can find uh, more information about the book on the website. And that website is? Well, gee, I should know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, I'm going to tell them the title, Before and After Loss, a Neurologist's Perspective on Loss, Grief and Our Brain Explores and Reflects on Losing and Grieving a Loved One on the Mind, Brain, and Body. Did you find that website? Are you asking me? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no? Okay. I don't have it right in front All of me. All right. Well, it's available on that website, doctor, but note also to on self. Amazon. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'm sure if you Google it, you'll come up. That's Lisa Shulman, S-H-U-L-M-A-N. Dr. Shulman, thank you so much for your time and your incredible work. Have a great day and stay warm. Remember, bourbon. <laughs> Stay warm. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye now. My name is Mark Farrell. The show is Insight on the Progressive Radio Network. Great conversation. I meant to tell the doctor she had an amazing voice. Very dulcet sounding, very soothing, right? Isn't that nice when you speak to somebody who's just got a, a nice sounding voice? It makes anything they say sound less reckless or irritating. <laughs> so before we introduce the doctor to the show, I talked about work history. And I was speaking to a friend recently, and then another friend also said to me about, you know, you've really done a lot of different jobs. And when I'm talking about different jobs, I'm not talking about really my professional life. Leading up to my professional life, I remember working in a garage mechanic shop when I was in fifth grade, sweeping up two days a week. I'd go there and sweep up, clean up his garage, organize his tools. That was one of my first jobs. Newspaper boy. I worked in a restaurant washing dishes and minor, minor prep like salads. I think that was in seventh grade. And I worked there, I think, too much, probably three or four days a week. I worked in the local food store, Food Town. And that was outside. And that was to actually cut down on crime because uh, there was a rash of women's purses being stolen. So Mark Farrell to the rescue. That never really happened. Basically, I was just a greeter and walked people to the cars. But the point is, I was raised on a solid work ethic. And I think that's so instrumental that we can never, never diminish the impact 
on how we instill that component and perspective into our youth. Because, hey, I'm a true believer in it takes a community, a village to raise a child. Also worked at Hubbard's Cupboard. Hubbard's Cupboard by me was like the 7-Eleven. I worked there on Saturday mornings, every Saturday morning. And when I was in eighth grade, I worked at one of the most popular bars and restaurants in town in Freel, New Jersey, called the Court Jester. I would go there every Sunday morning and work 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And essentially what I would do is I would scrub that kitchen from top to bottom and the bathrooms and clean the carpet. I mean, just, I mean, working like a dog. And then I would go into prep mode like 4 or 5 o'clock, make hamburger, salads, uh, chop onions. I remember making just a giant, giant pail of mushrooms for French onion soup and onions and everything. It was, it was a great learning experience. It was my first, well, actually my second entree into the restaurant realm. And of course, that's applicable nowadays because someone who loves to cook, etc. It was very fascinating. But the point I want to also make here is that I would walk out of there with $50 cash. $50 cash. I mean, that was huge back then. Eighth grade, $50 every Sunday. Man, they really got over on me, didn't they? <laughs> All that work for just $50? That's crazy. And I remember there was a there was a great manager at the time named Jim Vosk. I need to Google him. I think he's still in the area. He was a triple A, a former triple A baseball player, and I forget for which farm league he was with. Anyway, great guy. And I remember once I was up in his office and um, he offered me, I don't know how it worked, but basically he had chew, tobacco, chewing tobacco. And I took some. And I remember coming home. I actually went to my father's house that day after work and feeling sick and actually getting sick. And my father was infuriated with the restaurant because he thought they gave me alcohol. And I'm like, no, dad, this is just from chewing tobacco. And I found out certainly that that can have a reaction on you, especially being someone who's that young, eighth grade. So you're what, 14 years old. And that's a lot for your system to take. So anyway, oh my God, it's all the jobs. So I was a garbage man in college. That didn't last too long because it lasted like three weeks because I know they paid very, very well. And I begged the guy for a job. I didn't have a driver's license then, so I was limited on where I could work. So I could actually ride my bike, which is like five, seven miles away, to this garbage company, this hauler. He finally relented and gave me a job and put me with the fastest crew the first day, thinking I wouldn't survive. And I did. And I survived uh, many, many days. And then he switched me to another crew. And then I remember the last day I worked. Oh, I'm sorry, by the way, incidentally, I asked him for a raise because he was paying me like half of what everyone else was getting because he said, well, you're a white kid home from college. You're not going to last. I'm like, well, I am white, but I will last. (laughs) Kind of like that blue pill, right? Keeps you going. Anyway, um, I remember going down the road one day and it started to rain. And when it rains and you're holding for dear life on the side of of a, a garbage truck, those rain pellets feel like bullets going down the road 30, 40, 50 miles an hour. And it's scary. You're hitting a bump, you're bouncing, and you're holding on for dear life. So the guy looked at me on the other side of the truck and goes, you have to stand in the hopper to stay dry and safe. So inside the hopper is what? That's where the garbage goes. So I had to relent. I stepped inside the hopper and I said, wow, I've hit rock bottom. This is it. And I quit that day. I said, I'm sorry. I'm not destitute. I don't need to ride around in the back of a garbage truck. And I went home and said to my mom and my father, hey, I gave it the best effort, but you know what? I can't ride in the back of a garbage truck. So what other jobs? Of course, I've been a DJ, uh, major, major. I started out very, very small, but I worked my way up to major Venues in New York City, Rockefeller Plaza, uh, Top of the Rock, Windows of the World, which was on top of the former World Trade Center, Uh, a lot of different clubs in New York City, Um, countless parties from uh, ridiculously small to 1,000, 2,000 people, private parties. And those were very, very daunting because, you know, usually they're very, very dark. So here you have a visually impaired DJ. And this is, I started out certainly when DJs, uh, sorry, when CDs were in vogue and it was very, very hard to see. So it was kind of a um, interesting 
uh, job performance because I had to kind of make my own catalog of listing songs, which I did. And it was were in large font and I would have this category uh, of my library that served me well, which I still have. I show my kids it, and they're like, wow, this is really, really cool. I worked at Club Med, which I spoke about maybe four or six months ago on the show here. And I was a bartender there. Oh, how could I forget bartending? I bartended at numerous places um, in the Jersey Shore, on the Jersey Shore, in New York City, on Upper East Side. And, and that was a whole experience in life in itself. A uh, sociological experiment with dealing with people who are sober and <laughs> people who are not sober. And um, just how the psyche works and diplomatically kicking people out, flirting with girls. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. So I'm sure I'm missing uh, a couple other things, but it's interesting when I think about it, um, all the colorful experiences I had, all the great people, and all the skills. Oh, I forgot about being a carpenter, working on job sites, landscaping. Oh, I knew I forgot a bunch. Oh, what else have I done? I did work in a bike shop. I didn't get paid. I just kind of like volunteered because I wanted to learn more about fixing bikes. Um... Yeah. And when I worked in the food store, I mentioned before about being in the security realm outside. I also worked inside. I worked in the produce department, worked as a cashier, worked cleaning the butcher's locker room, uh, meat room, I should call it. So every day I'd have to put on a white coat and a heavy, heavy, uh, like a thermal shirt and go in there and clean up all the meat, blood and guts. But that's the downside. The upside was... I could bring my radio in and just jam. So that's what I would do. I have these confines all to myself, put on great music and just rock out and clean this place top to bottom. And they loved it. And I also would unload the truck. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is I have a a huge experience doing a bevy of different fields. And it wasn't until I got into college, certainly that my interest in radio and music was certainly when I was a, a young kid. But until I started turning my sights to a professional level and got an internship in uh, New York City Radio uh, and never looked back since 1987, 88 was my internship um, and it was a great, great experience. And it brought me to, um, you know, full circle to talk radio, but um, fascinating uh, 15 years at a uh, commercial smooth jazz station in New York City uh, where I met just legends after legends. Matter of fact, um, One of them just died yesterday. Oh, God, his name just escapes me right now. But a fascinating experience on air and as creative services director, and which turned into an alternative rock station. And that was phenomenal. I actually got fired along with everybody else and then rehired. I was the only one rehired, myself and one other person out of a staff of 50, uh, rehired to be on air again and also creative services director. So, it's been an incredible, joyful experience. Everything I've done, I think, has really benefited me. And I think, uh, certainly, as you know, as a listener, as someone who's done a lot, um, whether it's in multiple disciplines or in one field, how it just makes you a more educated individual, whether it's just for personal reasons or edification in your profession as well. Because it's amazing how much you can gain just by the interaction of people. And and believe me, I I think that um, it's vital for kids, going back to what we were talking before about in the earlier part of the show, about education and dedicating enough time to schoolwork. But I also think it's vital to be involved in a community and to have a job. And of course, when they get older, they can have more hours dedicated to that. But when they're in high school, uh, I would like my kids to have jobs. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it makes them understand Um, and respect the value of money, what it represents, what it can buy, what it can't buy, and so many other things that I think are crucial and vital that a lot of our millennials, millennials, did I say that? (laughs) Uh, But it's crucial for everyone to understand because sometimes the lines get blurred and we forget about this thing that we're just sliding in and out of a machine all the time, but it represents money. It's a denomination. Yes, you only see it once a month, when you pay your Visa bill or MasterCard or uh, American Express or whatever the case may be. But the reality is it's how we live and how do we pay for this? How do we prepare to pay for this? By education, through education, by getting the experience, through trades, through uh, part-time jobs, through internships, all these 
serious uh, pieces of education really come together and make an incredible, solid, and worthy, respectable person. (sighs) That was a lot, huh? (laughs) I hope you took notes. I certainly didn't. Well, listen, that's it for our show today. I want to thank uh, Dr. Shulman for appearing. Really pick up her book. It's just fascinating, and especially if you know somebody who's grieving. Her book, again, is Before and After Loss, A Neurologist's Perspective on Loss, Grief, and Our Brain. I think it's really riveting. It really exposes and uh, delves into parts of the brain that we never expected and or anticipated. Not certainly I ever gave this thought, but the medical community about how grieving affects the brain and what we can do to really benefit our brain and our grieving process by having this information handy. If you'd like me to speak at your school, college, or corporation on a bevy of topics, including overcoming adversity, mental health, anti-bullying, resiliency, drugs and alcohol, and more, check out my website. It's markfarrowmotivation.com. It's markfarrowmotivation.com. Email is mark at markfarrowmotivation.com. Always like to thank the fine folks here at the Progressive Radio Network, Jesse and Alex. My name is Mark Farrell. Talk to you next Thursday. Gary Null is next.